Surveillance is both a technological and a legal problem. Technological solutions are often things we can do ourselves. We can use various privacy and anonymity technologies to protect our data and identities. These are effective, but can be thwarted by secret government orders. We need to fight the political battle as well. Political solutions require group effort, but are generally limited to specific countries. Technological solutions have the potential to be global. If Microsoft designs its Windows operating system with ubiquitous file encryption, or if the Internet Engineering Task Force decides that all Internet traffic will be encrypted by default, then those changes will affect everyone in the world who uses those products and protocols. The point is that politics can undermine technology, and also that technology can undermine politics. Neither trumps the other. If we are going to fix things, we need to fight on both the technological and political fronts. And it's not just up to governments and corporations. We the people have a lot of work to do here. Law professor Eben Moglen wrote, If we are not doing anything wrong, then we have a right to do everything we can to maintain the traditional balance between us and power that is licensing. We have a right to be obscure. We have a right to mumble. We have a right to speak languages they do not get. We have a right to meet when and where and how we please. If a police officer sits down within earshot, it's within your rights to move your conversation someplace else. If the FBI parks a van bristling with cameras outside your house, you are perfectly justified in closing your blinds. Likewise, there are many ways we personally can protect our data and defend ourselves against surveillance. I'm going to break them down into categories. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. You can alter your behavior to avoid surveillance. You can pay for things in cash instead of using a credit card, or deliberately alter your driving route to avoid traffic cameras. You can refrain from creating Facebook pages for your children and tagging photos of them online. You can refrain from using Google Calendar, or Webmail, or Cloud Backup. You can use DuckDuckGo for internet searches. You can avoid activating automatic surveillance systems by deliberately not tripping their detection algorithms. For example, you can keep your cash transactions under the amounts where the different kinds of financial institutions have to report the transaction to the feds. You can decline to discuss certain topics in email. In China, where automatic surveillance is common, people have started writing messages on paper, and then sending photographs of those messages over the internet. It won't help at all against a targeted attack, but it's much harder for automatic systems to monitor such messages, Steganography, hiding messages in otherwise innocuous image files, is a similar technique. This is the most important thing we can do to defend ourselves. Yes, the national security agencies of the large powerful countries are going to be able to defeat anything you can do if they want to target you personally, but mass surveillance relies on easy access to our data. And most corporate surveillance isn't nearly that directed or intense. Privacy Enhancing Technologies, or PETS, can help you block mass surveillance. There are lots of technologies available to protect your data. For example, there are easy-to-use plugins for browsers that monitor and block sites that track you as you wander the internet. Lightbeam, Privacy Badger, Disconnect, Ghostery, Flashblock, and others. Remember that the private browsing option on your browser only deletes data locally. So while it's useful for hiding your porn viewing habits from your spouse, it doesn't block internet tracking. The most important PET is encryption. 
Encrypting your hard drive with Microsoft's BitLocker or Apple's FileVault is trivially easy and completely transparent. Use a chat encryption program like Off the Record, which is user-friendly and secure. CryptoCAD is also worth looking at. If you use cloud storage, look for one that provides encryption. I like SpiderOak, but there are others. There are encryption programs for Internet Voice. Silent Circle, Torfin, Redphone, Blackphone. Try to use an email encryption plugin like PGP. Google is now offering encrypted email for its users. You lose some of the functionality you get when Google can search and organize your email, but the increased privacy might be worth it. DLS, formerly SSL, is a protocol that encrypts some of your web browsing. It's what happens automatically, in the background, when you see HTTPS at the beginning of a URL instead of HTTP. Many websites offer this as an option, but not as a default. You can make sure it's always on wherever possible by running a browser plugin called HTTPS Everywhere. This is not meant to be a comprehensive list. That would take its own book, and it would be obsolete within months. Technology is always changing. I'm not going to lead you on. A lot of this will be beyond the capabilities of the average viewer. PGP email encryption especially, is very annoying to use. The most effective encryption tools, are the ones that happen in the background even when you're not aware of them, like HTTPS Everywhere, and hard drive encryption programs. Some companies are working behind the scenes to secure the data of their users. The standards bodies that run the internet are sufficiently incensed at government surveillance, that they're working to make encryption more ubiquitous online. Also remember that there's a lot that encryption can't protect. Google encrypts your connection to Gmail by default, and encrypts your mail as it sits on its servers and flows around its network. But Google processes your mail, so it has a copy of the keys. The same is true for anything you send to any social networking site. Most metadata can't be encrypted. So while you can encrypt the contents of your email, the to and from lines need to be unencrypted so the email system can deliver messages. Similarly, your cell phone can encrypt your voice conversations, but the phone numbers you dial, the location of your phone, and your phone's ID number, all need to be unencrypted. And while you can encrypt your credit card data when you send it over the internet to an online retailer, that company needs your name and address, so it can mail your purchases to you. And finally, encryption doesn't protect your computer while in use. You can still be hacked, either by criminals or governments, but, again, this is targeted rather than indiscriminate. All this means that while encryption is an important part of the solution, it's not the whole of it. There are low-tech things you can do to block surveillance. You can turn location services off on your smartphone when you don't need them, and try to make informed decisions about which apps you permit to access to your location and other data. You can be smart about posting identifying details on public sites. When Edward Snowden first met journalists in Hong Kong, he made them all put their cell phones in a refrigerator to block all signals to and from the devices, so they couldn't be remotely turned into listening devices. Sometimes surveillance blocking is remarkably low-tech. A simple sticker stuck over a computer's camera can prevent someone who takes control of it remotely from taking pictures of you. You can leave the return address off an envelope to limit what data the post office can collect. Sometimes it is as easy as saying no, refusing to divulge personal information on forms when asked, not giving your phone number to a sales clerk at a store, and so on. I have my browser configured to delete my cookies every time I close it, which I do multiple times a day. I am still being surveilled, but now it's much harder to tie all those small surveillances back to me, and ads don't follow me around. When I shop at Safeway, I use a friend's frequent shopper number. That ends up distorting the store surveillance of her. Sometimes this is called obfuscation, and there are lots of tricks, once you start thinking about it. You can swap retailer affinity cards with your friends and neighbors. You can dress in drag. In Cory Doctorow's 2008 book entitled Little Brother, the lead character puts rocks in his shoes to alter the way he walks, to fool gate recognition systems. There is also safety in numbers. As long as there are places in the world where privacy-enhancing technologies keep people alive, the more we should use them, because that makes them all the more secure. It's like envelopes. If everyone used postcards by default, the few who used envelopes would be suspicious. 
Since almost everyone uses envelopes, those who really need the privacy of an envelope don't stand out. This is especially true for an anonymity service like Tor, which relies on many people using it to obscure the identities of everyone. You can also, and I know someone who does this, search for random names on Facebook to confuse it about who you really know. At best, this is a partial solution, data analysis is a signal-to-noise problem, and adding random noise makes the analysis harder. Deception can be extremely powerful if used sparingly. I remember a story about a group of activists in Morocco. Those who didn't carry cell phones were tracked physically by the secret police and occasionally beaten up. Those who did weren't, and could therefore leave their phones home when they really needed to hide their movements. More generally, if you close off all the enemy's intelligence channels, you close off your ability to deceive him. Some of these methods are harder than others. Some of us will be able to do more than others. Many people enter random info into web forms. Far fewer people, I've only ever met one who did this, search for random things on Google to muddle up their profiles. Many of these behaviors carry social, time, or monetary costs, not to mention the psychological burden of constant paranoia. I rarely sign up for retail affinity cards, and that means I miss out on discounts. I don't have a personal Facebook account, and that means I'm not as connected with my friends as I might otherwise be. But I do carry a cell phone pretty much everywhere I go, and I collect frequent flyer miles whenever possible, which means I let those companies track me. You'll find your own sweet spot. We should all do what we can, because we believe our privacy is important and that we need to exercise our rights lest we lose them. But for Pete's sake, don't take those silly online surveys unless you know where your data is going to end up. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This Everything Inside Me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.